everyone. My name is Chris Barkin, and I want to welcome all of you to the first William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar here this, in the fall semester here at the University of Illinois. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take care of a few household or housekeeping items. First of all, the old favorite, uh, if you have a cell phone, please uh, turn it off or put it on mute so that we don't disturb the speaker. Uh, if we have a fire alarm, I'd like you to, uh, in an orderly fashion, exit from the two exits um, as appropriate, and then go down the stairways uh, to the ground floor. At each of the stairways, there's a door to the outside right there at the bottom of the stairs, so just proceed on outwards. And I'd like to ask us, unless circumstances suggest otherwise, to plan to gather on the north side of Main Street and uh, make sure that the person next to you is, is, is gotten there. So. We'll use the buddy system, so like I say, look, look, look who's next to you and make sure they're out. Um, we're not expecting any severe weather today, but just in general, if there was any severe weather, we just need to go, instead of going uh, outside the building, we would stay on this floor, go down the hallway, uh, into the old part of Newmark Lab, and go all the way downstairs into the basement. It's a very safe place. There'll be an attendance list going around. If you haven't already signed it, um, please sign that. Um, and if you did not receive a direct email announcement of the seminar, um, uh, please add your name and legibly add your email address so we can add you to the list for, for future seminars. And I'm very pleased to see a lot of faces out there that I've seen before, and I'm also pleased to see some new ones, and I'm really glad to, ha really glad to have the, the, good, the, 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 the new participants in the seminar. Um, I need that list. Um, I'd also like to welcome those of you who are joining us by telephone. We have representatives from New York State DOT, Rail Sciences, Rail Star Engineering, BNSF Railway, Anson Professional Services, Sharma and Associates, um, Francis Giacoma, Ron Adams, Michigan Tech University, and CSX, uh, MIT University, uh, Parsons, Arcadis, uh, Metra, Amstead Rail, uh, University of British Columbia at Okanagan, okay. <laughs> uh, Illinois Department of Transportation, oh, and a, a, a very revered alum, Al Reinschmidt. Welcome, Al. So, uh, anyway, thank you all for joining us today. And um, those of you who are dialing in, if you would like to receive uh, continuing education units, or if you're here today and we'd like to receive continuing education units for your participation, please send L.B. Fry, who's sitting right here in front, an email, and uh, her email address was in the seminar announcement. Um, I'll ask the speaker if there are questions today. It'd be helpful if you can repeat them for the benefit of the, um, the people dialing in from uh, who won't be able to hear the questions from the back of the room. At this point, I'd like to introduce Scott Schmidt, who's uh, president of our Arima student chapter, who's going to tell us where to have a good time tonight. I would add that we do have something in particular to celebrate besides our guest, Gordon English, and our first day seminar of the, uh, of, the, of the semester, and that is we have two amongst us who passed their qualifying exam, Hussein Bowler and Mei Cheng Shi. Congratulations, you guys. Onward and upward. <laughs> it's only going to get harder now. <laughs> um, all right. The, um, the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored here at the University of Illinois by the National University Rail Center or New Rail Center. And on behalf of all of us here at the university, we thank the US Department of Transportation for their ongoing support um, of the center and of the seminar series. It's greatly appreciated by us on campus as well as those of you who are participating via the internet. I'm also pleased to announce that earlier this week, we were notified that the, um, by the US DOT that the New Rail Center was again selected for an award for the, in this year's competition. So this has been a big, uh, item on our minds for the last several months, and so we're really pleased to say that the New Rail Center will be continuing for several more years. So thanks again to everybody who's participated in that. 
And related to that, the New Rail Center will be having a um, exhibition booth at the upcoming ARIMA Annual Conference and Interchange 2013 uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, many of the students and faculty here are attending that. And one of the opportunities is for you to uh, participate in, uh, in that booth. We need students and faculty to sign up to spend uh, an hour or two there, uh, you know, just kind of talking about the New Rail Center and meeting people. It's a great opportunity for students. So I believe, Scott, uh, how, is there a Google Doc or how are, yeah. So um, if, if anybody would like to know about how to sign up for that, just please talk to me or Scott or uh, Tim Gress after the seminar. Um, okay, well, understanding energy efficiency and other environmental impacts of different modes of transport is critically important in making informed decisions about how to invest in transportation infrastructure and policy. On their surface, such st studies might seem relatively simple, but in fact, they're not. Um, understand they can be very complex, as a matter of fact. And understanding how they're done provides insights about the results, as well as a broader appreciation of the factors affecting transportation in general. Our presentation today will summarize two recent transportation modal comparison assessments. One is a 2013 study undertaken for the Chamber of Marine Commerce that compares the energy and emissions intensity of truck, rail, and ship in carrying cargo in the Great Lakes Seaway region. The other study was a 2007 comparison of passenger rail with bus, air, and auto LDV undertaken for Transport Canada. We're very fortunate to have uh, our speaker today. He's a longtime professional colleague and friend of mine. Gordon English has 35 years of consulting and research experience in transportation systems-oriented research programs. He completed his electrical his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at University of Manitoba in 1970 and completed his MBA at Queen's University in 1975. He then went to a position at the Canadian Institute of Guided Ground Transport at Queen's University, where he was for 19 years, and he rose there to the level of executive director. While with CIGTT, he directed several major investigations in the area of transportation energy, including railway electrification, mode of power, alternative fuels, and development of a train energy research program. He formed Transys Research Limited in 1994, where he is president. And since 1999, he's also been a partner with the Research and Traffic Group. Transys research activities are focused on contact res contract research and testing, while RTG activities are focused on economic and policy-relating consulting, including applications of energy and emissions models. Um, Mr. English is an internationally known energy systems analyst uh, and has a, was a visiting expert under the United Nations Development Program, and he's provided courses in energy modeling and analysis to, energy, to engineers at the Center for Electric Transportation in Bhopal, India. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mr. Gordon English, who will present the William Hay Engineering Seminar today, Transportation Energy Analysis and Modal Comparisons. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me know if you uh, can hear me all right at the back or if you can't hear me all right. And uh, I guess we'll make this a fairly informal process. If you have any questions on the way through, feel free to uh, raise your hand and, and raise them at that time. And uh, my scheduled departure is fairly fixed, though, and so if we don't have a chance to get to the end of the slides, I might, uh, you know, I'll go that way and then just end it after the energy portion rather than at the end there's a segment on on uh, congestion relief associated with passenger rail systems. Uh, so as uh, Chris indicated, uh, there's two projects that we uh, undertook that I'm reporting on. Uh, the one was this Great Lakes Seaway region bulk freight comparison, looking at energy efficiency and air emissions intensity of the three modes that were uh, evaluated. And the other is uh, intercity passenger rail comparison of uh, air emissions and highway congestion relief for uh, rail, automobile, air, and intercity bus. So doing the uh, the freight system first, uh, the comparison of the Great of the Great Lakes region, which is uh, shown here, the study area, it falls. Oops, wrong button. Involves for the marine system uh, vessels that, that transit through the uh, the Seaway Canal system between uh, the uh, between Montreal and Lake Ontario, 
and then through the Welland Canal between Lake Ontario and, and Lake Erie. And then there's another uh, set of Sioux locks uh, between Lake Superior and the, uh, the lower lakes. So the marine system is, is the, the vessels that operate on the Great Lakes and the Seaway um, are sized on the basis of the, that lock system. The uh, framework for the evaluation was to uh, treat each, to assess each mode uh, on the basis of carrying the existing mix of freight that the uh, marine mode carries in that region. So because it, uh, it is basically each mode carrying uh, the existing marine freight, the results are specific to that, that scenario. And the results that are shown and the numbers that are shown are all for the other modes. Are, uh, are on that basis. So it's not a set of results that would generally apply to any other um, modal comparison. Uh, each of these comparisons is specific to the, to the mix of cargo that's, that's being carried. Um, in the past, the, uh, the level of data that's available for these types of freight modal comparisons uh, varies significantly across the modes. And rail is usually the best uh, in terms of, of of reporting data through the uh, regulatory framework, the historic regulatory framework, and the public filings of information that the that the railways have, so it tends to be the, the best set of, uh, of data in terms of activity levels and and total fuel consumed. Uh, the truck side is uh, less detailed in terms of of what's available, and requires basically uh, estimates and, and test data on on individual pieces of equipment and, and deriving estimates through, uh, through simulation. And on the marine side, there's, there's really no requirement to report, uh, to report fuel consumption. So there, there has, in the past, not been a lot of information on what the actual situation is on the, on the marine side. So part of the study was collecting data, uh, fuel consumption data and operations data from the marine carriers on the Great Lakes Seaway. And we had the cooperation of the of both the domestic carriers and the international carriers that were coming into the Great Lakes system. And the size of the data set that we had from, from those people that were that were providing data accounted for 79% of the uh, total activity for that year. So it's a reasonable uh, reasonable sample of the of the marine operations in that area. Uh, because the because we're looking at cargo specific uh, comparisons here, um, you know the railways report very detailed data uh, to the regulatory authorities, uh, both on the on the emissions certification side, uh, but also on the activity side and fuel consumption side. But but it's at an aggregate level on the fuel consumption side, and activity is broken out. Uh, in some detail by equipment type. So the, the rail uh, cargo specific numbers were derived and estimated by a simulation. Uh, so they're not specific numbers for these categories. They're our estimates derived from what was publicly uh, available. Uh, truck emissions, as I said, are basically tied to to uh, coast down tests and uh, publish literature on specific testing of individual vehicles rather than any reports at a national level uh, or activity at a national level uh, is the best because of the there's there's significant differences in the types of equipment that operate uh, in Canada by cargo type and to some extent in the US by cargo type. Uh, so the truck side was essentially a simulation process of of individual vehicle types. Uh, so the comparison that was done was based on the time we started this. Uh, the most recent data available across the modes was uh, 2010. So the, the uh, activity data and the equipment performance was based on 2010. But in addition to that, we wanted to look at the, the long-term potential of each of the modes uh, because there are very 
levels of regulatory change that, that are in the mix for, for the different modes. And for the marine mode in particular, um, there's been very little invest, investment in new equipment in the past, whereas with some recent changes in, in the uh, regulatory framework, they're, um, they're making renewed investments in equipment over the next few years. So, but, but in terms of the technology that we're looking at, so we're looking at long-term effectiveness and of each of the modes is totally renewed with what we're selecting as, as an estimated 2015 technology but still diesel-based, no alternative fuels for, for any of the modes, and no major structural changes for any of the modes other than fuel with technology that exists. But meeting the regulatory requirements of 2016 and 20, in some cases, uh, regulations that are in effect in 2015, but they don't have to be, they aren't completed and in effect for some of the modes until 2018. 20. This is essentially saying anything that's on the books that has to be done, whether it's by 2020 or 2024, comes into effect within the time frame. It's assumed that 100% of the fleet has that, uh, that specification. So on the uh, on the marine side, in terms of the, the mix of commodity. Traffic that's involved, which is the, the basis of the comparison. Um, we're showing there that that annually there's uh, U.S. the U.S. side of the operations traffic that's just going between U.S. ports is over 50 percent of the tonnage that's carried. Cross border activity, uh, Canada to Canada, port activity and import and export activity uh, account for the other. 40% or so, and in total, we've got close to 150 million uh, cargo tons of, of traffic on the on the Great Lakes system. And the distribution of that traffic is highly weighted towards bulk uh, commodity traffic, uh, and the largest component is iron ore, and then coal and aggregate grain. Um, the general cargo is the only category that has a mix of uh, of lighter density uh, type traffic, essentially. And the, the fleets that are involved on the marine side, uh, the U.S. traffic is essentially on the, uh, the upper lakes and from Lake Erie uh, west. And the equipment that's used on those lakes is sized to the uh, dimensions of the sea locks, which are bigger than the, the uh, seaway locks. So the vessels... The U.S. fleet is uh, dominated mainly by these 1,000-foot uh, vessels that are both longer and wider than the vessels that go through the seaway system. So the seaway system, uh, both the international fleet and the Canadian fleet, uh, is sized essentially to go through, through the locks into the lakes. Uh, across all of the modes, the, uh, all the modes essentially follow the same laws of physics and the, the type of data that's available and used for modeling uh, propulsion of these in these systems is of the form, you know, an, an A plus B factor times the weight, uh, a, a speed proportional factor and a speed squared factor to determine the, the, the forces involved and the power is just the uh, force times the speed and energy divides by speed. So the, the energy is essentially directly tied to the resistive force uh, of the uh, required for propulsion. And the other two components of the, of the system are essentially stored energy components, potential energy in, in climbing grades and, and changes recovery, potential recovery of that energy and in, in going down grades, and the same with uh, kinetic energy accelerating up to speed and potential for recovery uh, uh, or dissipation in brakes uh, when you slow down to uh, to lower speeds. 
so the, the stored energy component is uh, is essentially only applicable if you're if you're applying brakes and, and dissipating it. Uh, and this slide is just comparing the, the cost of speed, essentially, in terms of the power that's required to uh, for the various modes. And the marine mode, because it's in water, has a has a high <coughs> resistance, a high uh, hydrodynamic resistance, and potentially feasible to to operate at high speeds. But because it operates at at low speeds. Um, has a very low uh, resistance drag factor, uh, whereas the uh, rail on steel wheel on steel rail is sort of second in this mix. Uh, and then truck that's uh, rubber tires on road is the is the least. And if they, if, if this was a power chart, uh, these would be divided by speed, and then it would be a, a closer match than it is as a uh, as a power match. But it is important from the power side in that, that the propulsion power that's required by the different modes uh, is sensitive is sensitive to the, the characteristics of the marine mode can use very heavy low speed engines that, that can be very efficient have low friction losses uh, and have engines that uh, low speed diesel engines that are operating at 100 rpm or three or four hundred rpm uh, the rail system are using medium speed diesels uh, at uh, 900 rpm and truck engines are using the higher speed diesel engines at 1000 rpm so the friction losses in the engines uh, are tied to, the, to those operating speeds and if you go up to more uh, to higher speeds obviously you get to aircraft where you're using certain lightweight uh, turbine engines and paying fuel penalties in those factors in those and then with high-speed rail, you're essentially moving the engine off of the locomotive to wayside because you couldn't put enough uh, too much weight in terms of just engine power to to uh, attain the speeds. This, this is mainly just to illustrate that point. Um, in addition to And that chart is just comparing basic uh, comparing propulsion energy. You have uh, other energy components, other sources of fuel consumption, and auxiliary power. Some are going to hotel power is uh, is one of those, and it's most uh, felt by marine, where you've got the, the about 20, over 20 crew members that, that live on these vessels. So the hotel requirements for that mode, it's an inherent characteristic of the mode, except that for all of the modes, when you get to port or when you get to your destination, um, both rail and truck also have a uh, have a requirement for a requirement for crews, and they're met in different ways. Uh, because we were getting fuel data from the marine side, uh, we knew and, and they essentially are using different engines and different types of fuel in some cases for uh, for hotel power than they do for propulsion power. So you can identify what, what's going into the auxiliary services and what was going into propulsion. So to make sure we had an equal footing, we didn't know, we don't know what, what the energy intensity is in terms of hotel power for the rail mode where you're you know, potentially using punk houses or hotel rooms or taxiing crews back to uh, to an original site, but the easiest thing to do is just take out a, a portion of the marine mode when they're at port. So we took out 10% of the of the uh, auxiliary power when vessels were at port, and for the other 90% of the time when they were at port, and all of the time when they were underway, uh, hotel power for the marine side. Uh, the other aspect for marine is that. Some of the vessels have self-unloading equipment. So the auxiliary power system operates this uh, unloading equipment when they're at port. Some of the vessels don't have equipment, and and the unloading uh, cranes are on on shore. And for the other modes, um, none of them are essentially self-unloading. So again, the easiest way 
in the study was because we could identify the amount of fuel was being used by the excluded it from the from that mode. Another factor in, in actual total end fuel consumption is the empty return ratios, or in the case of, of marine, the ballast state they return in. And for marine, um, if they are returning empty, in order to get the, uh, the propeller submerged in the water and just for basic uh, handling, uh, they have to load the vessel uh, with partially load the vessel with water, with ballast water. So there's no real empty return for marine. They're always they're always returning with a uh, state that's similar to the, to the motor state, um, and that state can can vary by cargo again. So for rail, we've got uh, empty return ratios from the available pipe essentially. For a truck, we had empty return ratios from. Uh, from data from samples, uh, wayside uh, interviews and samples of, of trucks uh, undertaken by uh, Statistics Canada. So again, on a on an equipment type of equipment basis, we know what the uh, relative empty return ratios are. And in general, trucks always going to have the lowest uh, empty return ratio because they've got triangulation opportunities. Um, and marine because it's uh, it's an expensive option to be going it's a, it's a more expensive option to be traveling empty or traveling with ballast uh they tend to be in the middle and rail depending on the category of equipment for this kind of equipment and in the unit range you've got fairly high uh, use of specialized equipment and, and relatively high empty return ratios And the other factor, if, if you're doing a specific comparison, is the relative security of getting from point A to point B. And for the, the Great Lakes scenario, it can vary significantly. You know, Marine's going to have a significant advantage if you're going across the, across the lake from one side of the lake to the other, the other two modes they're going around, uh, whereas both the ground modes would have uh, advantages going from Duluth to Chicago direct route by uh, by rail and by um, but so we weren't looking at individual movements we were developing we were making a comparison on a uh, an equal distance travel basis developing the metrics for uh, per kilometer and then it's a but the data can be used to make uh, to make additional comparison Uh, so the truck simulation uh, was basically simulating specific uh, equipment types and configuration and the type of equipment that was that were being used for the various cargos uh, was from this uh, stack and sample of, uh, of operators and it's across Canada sample. So that data includes the type of equipment that's used, the number of axles, the average load weight for that category of, of uh, cargo and the empty return or the number of empty miles to uh, quarter miles. So each piece of equipment and, and these, the range of equipment that's there essentially is used on the Canadian side of the border on the U.S. side. It's uh, predominantly the uh, Five axle truck with two axles at the back rather than the three, three kind of, of the three axle trucks. And then the age, the age, because of the, to some extent on the efficiency side, but more on the emission side, the age of the fleet is important. So the truck fleet, uh, the age of the fleet was divided into uh, those activities that are, that are uh, long haul movements and those that are. So the aggregate uh, aggregate category tends to be a fairly short haul, and most of the other ones are, are longer haul movements. And 
and the rail simulation was essentially taking taking the coefficients associated with specific types of equipment um, and doing a simulation of those types of equipment, that mix of equipment, and fitting it to the activity levels that are reported by the uh, by the railways that operate in that region, the Great Lakes region, and getting the uh, getting those to to add up to the total for fuel consumption, with an allowance for uh, for idling that and switching activity. So the uh, and the data are essentially available on for CN and CP on the Canadian side. And we just looked at Norfolk Southern, combined Norfolk Southern and CSX on the on the US side. And for the range of equipment that, that we're interested in, I mean you do get uh, you know as as one would expect to get a significant range for a unit coal train with that uh, 111 tons per, per car getting up to uh, 696 cargo ton miles, um, cargo ton miles per U.S. gallon or cargo ton kilometers per year, the, uh, the other metric. Um, and for the mix of cargo that was involved in ours, we've got that range from 696 down to the general freight up to 349. And the two railways, or the, the four sets of railways, were all in a, in a reasonable range of, of agreement in terms of the overall average number. Uh, so in terms of how they compare, this slide is, is showing that the energy efficiency in terms of carbon ton miles per, per U.S. gallon on the top axis and carbon ton miles per year on, the, on the lower axis. And the top one is, is based on existing technology. Um, and the lower one is based on our renewal assumptions. And the renewal assumptions, as I said, everything is, is fully renewed to sort of the, the best in class, essentially existing technology. And the Marine sees a more significant improvement, mainly because um, they have not renewed their fleet as, as truck and rail have been improving their operating efficiencies, equipment efficiencies, and, and motor power efficiencies. Green uh, have replaced their vessels that, that are you know, 30 to 50 years old and have been, have been up until recently uh, somewhat hampered in, in renewing the fleet on the Canadian side. There was a uh, 25% duty on any foreign built vessels that were brought into the country. So the, the marine operators, that, that essentially was, didn't make it economical for them to, uh, to renew their fleets. And on the U.S. side, there's, there's the Jones Act that, that says that all vessels have to be built uh, domestically. So the cost of, of a vessel on that basis becomes, uh, Uneconomical to renew their fleet, but the twenty uh, the the duty on the Canadian side was removed uh, a couple of years ago, and this uh, efficiency is based on one of those vessels that are ordered now for the renewed fleet, and this assumes that the, the complete Canadian fleet is renewed to that uh, category, um, and the U.S. fleet they have they they won't. It's not assuming that they're renewing vessels. We're not assuming that the Jones Act is going to change. But we're assuming that some some of the vessels have begun to uh, re-engine their equipment with uh, with higher efficiency uh, uh, engine technology and also maybe changing the bow shapes to get a better some of the for the, best, for the data we got on the vessels that, they, that was provided to us. Uh, on the rail side, we're not, we're not assuming major advances in diesel technology efficiency. That would, would apply generally to all of the modes. Um, but some improvement in, 
in uh, in axolotes further increase in and idle reduction. I forget what the what the overall operating savings was, and on truck. GHG based regulations that call for truck to improve their efficiency by a defined amount by the year 2020. It's got targets and so this assumes that, that those improvements are made for 100% of the fleet uh, in this comparison. And on the US fleet, uh, the same. And same. There are differences because of the cargo mix. There's a different international fleet, following the type of cargo. Whereas the U.S. fleet is based on. So there are some differences in all of the modes. That being compared. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of all of the emissions, essentially we, we tied, or the emissions intensities can be tied directly to the fuel quantities. So you get uh, similar efficiency, but more specific sensitivities to the types of regulations that exist. That are allowed. So this comparison is just showing the two-way fleet. In fact, all these slides are two-way fleet is the one to compare, um, rather than the than the U.S. fleet for the same. Similar slides exist for it. And the uh, the dashed line there on the on the rail one is just showing what. What the average, if you just said rail is characterized by its average performance, uh, what you would say um, that you would say represents rail, whereas on a cargo specific basis, in the comparison, saying that if, if you consider rail only hauling the marine cargo mix, uh, then that's the efficiency that's actually being considered. And the truck, if you, uh, it's all cargo specific. Uh, hauling bulk uh, commodities is always going to be more efficient than, than lighter density commodities. So each of the modes is, is shown in probably a better light than, than, than uh, well, obviously better than it would be if it was if the full mix was lighter density cargo. Uh, so the truck, and the reason we don't show an average for truck is just that nobody really knows what the what the average performance of a truck is. Bottom are, are just the index values to marine. So this is a set of characteristics on a uh, post renewal basis. So the following the uh, cargo characteristic of the Seaway fleet, the international and Canadian fleet, um, post renewal with all modes being fully renewed. And in fact, the rail at the one point. One times the uh, uh, and then the full combined fleet comparison for 2010 and post renewal, both the US, US fleet and the uh, Canadian and international fleets, and all of the cargo comparison. 1.2 in 20 for rail and 23 for truck. Post renewal 1.6 for rail for, for rail and truck. Uh, the other side of the emissions is contaminants. And while GHG emissions are global and uh, time insensitive, and it's just a matter of by adding them up and saying what they are to compare them, are are local have a local uh, impact and are time sensitive. So it's uh, more important to know where the 
and CAC emissions uh, are also fuel sensitive. So on the on the vessels that are being compared, uh, the auxiliary power system different diesel generators in the propulsion system and the diesel those generators are using normal diesel fuel for and to use uh, a mix of heavy fuel oil or a mix of residual oil what's left over at the bottom of the uh, of the distillation power uh, and that's mixed with with diesel fuel to get a uh, medium density fuel or in, in the using 100% fuel oil for the propulsion of the power. And the, the CAC emissions for each of those fuels uh, is different and then regulations as well. Uh, and because of, but because marine Operating out in open water, the, the intensity of those emissions, CAC emissions are, uh, are the impacts of or consequences of CAC emissions are most heavily tied to uh, to health impacts, and so the uh, the intensity of emissions are most concerned on land and in urban areas. So we were we were deriving. An on land equivalent for marine uh, because marine is the only one that, that is basically out in the middle of the lake for much of its journey. When, when it's uh, at port, it's fuel type, and when it's on the rivers and closer to lower speeds, the marine emissions went through that segmentation of what was being used and where it was being used and how close it was to land at that time. And the uh, my assumption on the intensities was that if they were beyond 25 miles from a river or a port, um, that the, the on-land intensity was 4% of what it would be in storage literature application. And if it was port or in a river segment, then or if it was within 25 miles or in a river port, land equivalent intensity. So there's two measures on the marine side that, that those and the uh, bottom solid bar is the one that says equivalent uh, on land intensity of those emissions is both that are, that are larger in, in river segments and 4% when they're on open water. And the dashed line says what it would be if the intensity on open water is that the same impact as the airport. So the 4% the 4% wasn't our simulation in a specific territory. Uh, we didn't have the scope to do that. And the, whether it's 4% or whether it's a different number, the relative impact will be somewhere in that. Um, and then rail, but the uh, but on a near land equivalent basis, marine would be higher than rail. It's higher than, uh, than rail. And that's recognizing that at this time in 2010, we general had a lower emissions regulatory requirements. It's mainly the efficiency differences that, that penalize uh, truck in, in that time frame. Then the comparison uh, of NOx um, post renewal is uh, shown on this chart. The same thing for marine. The what the at source emissions comparison would be. Taking the, regu the regulations that will be in place 
or not for each of the modes in 20. Truck, truck had its regulations were in place in 2010, uh, but because the fleet that we were comparing in 2010 had that age difference, only about, I forget what it was, but I think it was 12. The fleet was actually 20. Whereas this is assuming post renewal that, that all of the truck all the regulation was introduced in 2010. In this comparison, 100% of the In this comparison, same with rail, rail has to meet the current new NOx requirements. But what rail will be, all the bar for the truck at the bottom and the top. Truck had this there in 2010. There's certification data available for how they actually are, how the engine manufacturers are actually performing. And all the other 2010 characterization was all based on certification data for each of the modes. Uh, whereas in this comparison, both marine and rail regulations haven't come into place yet. So it's in the regulatory limit. And test perform the regulatory limit. So the truck is showing both what it would be if it if, if it only compared. So the lake for land is the upper bar and the certification data available is that both real screen would be better than showing at the regulatory limit. Uh, sulfur Truck has has gone through uh, regulatory requirement already. That rail has gone through a first stage of of uh, reduction in fuel it uses, and we'll go through another reduction uh, in the 2016 vintage. Where the marine sector has not uh, seen what its fuel requirement is. Uh, or what its sulfur content is for fuels. Uh, one of the fuels tends to be the same as the basic diesel fuel that's available in the market. So the, the, even though it's a marine diesel oil, it, it tends to be uh, the heavy diesel oils. Uh, and so the data that's there on the on the sulfur content. Provided the same carriers that that's on the marine side that were providing data on the sulfur content of those fuels because they're in the middle of the regulatory to to move to lower sulfur content uh, and the post regulatory sulfur content uh, by once all of the modes have to meet the advertised. Uh, Regulatory conditions on sulfur emissions uh, gives you this comparison. More to the uh, more to the energy comparison and uh, it's all meeting similar types of uh, sulfur content. On the green side, they still have a higher sulfur. They, they have a higher regulatory limit that's available, but because they're a small user. Of, of diesel oil, so by by time they have they meet the new regulatory requirement, they will have to use diesel oil. They won't be able to use any more heavy fuel oil, uh, but they are allowed to have a one percent uh, sulfur content, whereas the others two modes are 0.055 percent. Uh, but because they're they're basically supplying the same fuel oil, uh, switch over to the diesel fuel. That's the diesel fuel that will be available. And even the data we were getting for those for the part of the fleets that were using diesel fuel already, I mean they were already below the one percent that they were essentially close to what we are getting now for for their fuel. So essentially a, a movement to a, a common fuel. And I think it's uh, entirely tied to sulfur content. So again the marine mode is uh, because of the fuel, that 
justify a source uh, emission of particular matter. Again, you know, somewhere in that range between the, the near land equivalent equivalent is the, uh, the proper metric of, of comparison. So, 2010, I the truck, all of the regulatory requirements are in place already for truck. And it's just fleet age distribution that leads to differences. Uh, whereas rail is going to have to be uh, um, and matter will be just tied to the to the sulfur content of the fuel again. So that's the, uh, the principle. Uh, and that was that was the, the doing a, a freight comparison. This uh, next other slide is a passenger mode comparison. So essentially, comparing uh, via rail in Canada, in Canada, and in this case, we were looking at at specific OD at twelve. Uh, a mix of services uh, and a mix of geographic uh, The slides are essentially one all a corridor or corridor operations. Uh, passenger rail. So all the purple ones are in that of the uh, uh, there is operation on Vancouver Island. Person of has the air as the competing mode. So the, the distance of the rail mode trip and going from 186 sorry, 186 Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, kilometers. Corridor type of rail operation. WLH or Eastern and Western long haul services. Uh, the regional. Service, I'm sorry, regional service. Uh, with the Churchill the remote track service as well. And you can, as you would expect, in almost all cases, there is the shortest distance. So this wasn't used at all, but it's a key ingredient. For the destination, uh, or while the air distance. Rail, so rail is the rail distance from the oil station to the destination station. This is talk, well, this is talking about uh, just the modal distance. The comparison is is including the ground access uh, activity as well for uh, for the automobile trip. Some 
to a fixed point. Characterization is kind of Power is important. The way that motor power is used. Automotive is uh, also an older locomotive. I'm not sure if Amtrak still uses any of them or not. But, but in Via's case. The way they operate, their, the way they provide their hotel power at that time, uh, take off of the engine shafts. So, the, to provide constant frequency current for hotel power, the engine is always operating at 900 RPM. So, whether you're, whether you're at uh, half power, it's operating at full speed. So, get some improvement in efficiency. You're operating with two locomotives in a train. They, they put one of them in freight mode to provide speed with the power demand, and just one of them provides the power. Uh, and then the average, because we're comparing in the end, the, the main metrics are the emissions per per passenger kilometer or per passenger uh, passengers per piece of equipment. And looking at the which service is going to see quite a range of that. Long hauls where you got cars. When the sleeping cars for the uh, Western long hauls are uh, at the end of the train. It's, uh, has an open panoramic car. And then there's dining cars and baggage cars. And a portion to on a basis regardless of whether it's total or sleeping. Uh, the characterization is different to the because they're, they have a local impact. Regulations for air regulations are tied to this landing takeoff sequence. Uh, only when they're uh, climbing up in the airport or descending into the airport from 3,000 feet. The emissions as having some impact, uh, whereas the GHG emissions are actually in place throughout the whole cycle. And the landing takeoff cycle, because it's a regulatory requirement, again, there's certification data for all of the, all of the engines. The aircraft engine has to be certified for this defined landing takeoff cycle. So for air, you've got the, uh, to characterize the air system, um, we went through the process of finding out what aircraft were used what mix of aircraft are used on each of those pairs and what type of engines are on those aircraft and for that particular engine type. Um, and in terms of using the uh, Pater are, are based on simulation and a fixed Because it's a real world comparison and you know, fuel consumption, trip consumption. Now, on the air side, when you do the publicly available data, you know, external distance is always a person. Um, and we did have a distance for the airports. 
I mean, when you know the navigation distance, the actual distance with employees that are incurred in the certain airport, longer distances. I'm on the, for the LTO cycle, all those, the, the part of it that's on the ground is essentially a variable for, for delays. So we went through the process of after we had the assignments for the principal aircraft that were involved going from the aircraft to uh, regional jets um, for a couple of the to the to the turboprops. For each of those situations and the proportions of each of those aircraft. Um, the actual simulation of that flight or the uh, you know, simulated movement of distance between those two airports does vary as you would as you would expect. And this comparison is a comparison of aircraft of energy intensity. It would come much closer together. The fact that some of the aircraft are bigger aircraft. Uh, but going through that process for each of the planes uh, involved, allocating allocating them to the traffic. But the final step was then to. The airlines uh, do report publicly good data on total fuel consumption and activity data on total miles flown. And some of that's broken down by, by type of aircraft. We're going to be into the come up with scale factors for And scale factors for the simulated fuel consumption versus what the what the actual fuel consumption would be in the real world. Uh, bus characterization at the age of the engine. Engines were were also involved. As well as our estimate as a bus operator, on the automobile side, uh, you know, the problems on the automobile side, no one really knows what the To trying to compare survey data with we highway uh, fuel consumption, uh, but recognize that everyone uh, fuel consumption was always being five percent of what in reality you were getting in highway travel. You know, at this level of comparison, that, that's not a problem. But for any comparison that wants to use, uh, that wants to compare open highway uh, fuel consumption, which is which we're trying to do in a project that we have underway right now, I mean, this type of highway travel just doesn't represent the normal inner city highway travel that that we are So even though the EPA certification highway cycle now. Uh, to a reasonable performance of, of highway travel, the way they do it isn't by highway travel, it's by adding more speed variations, more stops, uh, more things that don't represent highway travel. But, so it's important to know what the drug is. So 
So the, the, in terms of the actual final results, we're, uh, so each of those 12 quarters, I just picked out some of the short haul ones and the, uh, and the long haul and the corridor. So this, this one, the little remote service on Victoria Courtney, I mean, that's in, in all of these, you'll find that bus ends up being the, the lowest, uh, the most fuel efficient and the lowest uh, emitter um, in many cases, uh, and mainly because of, of the, the equipment that's being used. You've got high seating density and you've got, uh, you know, I uh, propulsion engine on board your uh, self-propelled vehicle. So this this uh, comparison in the uh, remote service was the only one where there was a, a rail diesel car involved. That went with uh, one of these self-propelled rail vehicles. It comes closest to, to looking like a bus. And that's the one where, where rail came closest to a uh, bus. And that's the one that happened that air didn't have a direct flight between those two origin destinations. It had two local services from the two centers into one major center. So it involved not only an indirect trip, but involved four LTO or two LTO cycles instead of just the one. Uh, similar distance in the in the uh, corridor, you know, is a conventional locomotive hauled uh, railway coach. And Toronto, Montreal, um, same corridor, but uh, but longer distance, and, and it represents actual load factors for the services that are being compared. So because we were getting confidential load factor data from all of the carriers, we couldn't show seat miles. Um, they didn't want people to be able to determine actual load factors in the in the competitive markets. So we're just showing um, the end, the, the final end result in terms of per passenger kilometer, grams per passenger kilometer, or grams per trip. And in in all cases, you know the the fuel. Again, at that time, the same relating back to the freight comparison, we were where we were looking at future technology, and this one was just technology at the time in 2007. The environment at that time. In general, are higher for the uh, for the mode, and because on the air mode, the PAC part of the cycle only involves the LO, the LPO part. You get different com compared to metrics on the GHG side than you do on the on the CAC. Uh, the other thing we did was just look at one full mode shift. Uh, they asked for the Montreal Toronto corridor what would be the implications of eliminating rail service. And because it's full elimination, all the, the cross modal elasticities didn't really matter. We're just saying we'll use the existing uh, mode percentage uh, mode choice mix and say that that's where the rail passengers go to. So you get 48% of them. Going to air, 40, 40, close to 48% to auto, and only 3.6% to bus. And so, even, you know, it, it's a common story in that, that the bus is the most efficient, but because bus uh, isn't really an attractive mode, and in these environmental comparisons, you're not comparing comfort or, or value of speed attributes. You're just basically comparing emissions rather than why people are using that mode. When you go beyond the per per passenger kilometer basis and see what you can actually achieve, uh, then it depends what what people are actually going to choose uh, when you try to constrain the choices. So in this case, most of them are going to the higher emitting modes uh, on a GHG comparison. And for this particular case, given the uh, passenger levels that were involved, uh, we were talking about, about 26,000 tons a year of incremental GHG emissions uh, for that quarter. And uh, I think I will end at that point rather than get into the congestion stuff just because of timing. 
start any. Otherwise, I will skip through to the thank you stage. Sorry. Not, not specifically a uh, carbon tax. We have, I mean, we looked at the policy issue, but never quantified what the relative effectiveness would be. You know, how many people would actually react to it? Although, if you're looking for data, I guess uh, British Columbia has introduced the carbon tax, and I think there probably are researchers out there that have been monitoring the the post carbon tax response. So if there aren't publications, there certainly will be data. Uh, yeah, you might, well, I'm not sure what their response was in that particular case. But yeah, you could see mode shifts in addition to conservation. I mean, the advantage of, of just a carbon tax is people are free to choose. And but you, it's hard to predict what they're going to choose, whether it's conservation or whether it's uh, alternate modes. And those choice, but those choices are very rarely going to be made with you know sort of the full details of what it means to make a move to a different mode. Yeah. Right. Well, on, on the freight side, it's because we're we're comparing, you know, the same mix of traffic. I mean, it's very critical to to define what that traffic mix is. Most of the comparisons that are done say, here's the average rail performance, here's the average truck performance, here's the average marine performance. And in the previous marine studies, in most cases, they didn't know what the marine performance was because there were, there were no data to base it on. And in the case of rail, it was that dashed bar above the bar that we were showing, uh, the solid bar. Uh, so the average mix of cargo is, is uh, less efficient than the mix that we showed. And the same for truck. I mean, truck's going to be far more efficient hauling uh, the cargo that we're hauling, and because Canada, the equipment in Canada allows uh, double trailers and eight axles and heavier axle loads, significantly heavier axle loads, uh, the truck performance in hauling those sets of cargo are going to be better than if you were doing a comparison of of hauling. You know, if, if this, if our study was was to do a, a modal comparison uh, characterized by trucks conventional traffic, and what would happen if you shifted that to rail and marine, you'd get a totally different set of answers. I mean, all of them would be would be significantly different each mode. Uh, so it's all, it's all very cargo specific, and the problem with a lot of the studies that are done are that easy number to get is the average number um, that, that's published. So most of those comparisons, I mean, if, unless you're talking about well, in most cases, there's just not much lot of value to the comparison because any mode shift is going to involve some mix of, of cargo, either one that's on one mode that's not really characteristic representative of the other mode going to that mode. So you can't compare what one's performance is with its cargo with what the other mode's performance is with its mix of cargo. You can only you you really have to do it by by simulation of that. The type of equipment that's used and the and the density of the cargo that's being carried. We'd love to have the three three different mode shifts and the uh, 
Uh, well, I guess in terms of just that discussion we had, that, that if people are going to do modal comparison and and make arguments for mode shifts, uh, they should be as specific to the market that's being looked at. So in each of those cases, uh, it's a much more complex process than just going to the, the, the aggregate statistics that are readily available and saying, here's the average performance of, of rail. I mean, that's the average performance of rail hauling its mix of traffic. And you can't compare that to truck hauling its mix of traffic or to marine hauling its mix of traffic. So if you, if you really want to look at that mode shift, it's important to know what, what of those cargoes you want to shift and what the impact of that cargo being shifted would be.